I just want to say, uh, thank all the people that support my family in this and uh, I just want to tell them that when the feds stepped in, it took a, a big relief off our family because we know justice is close to getting justice for my son. Yes, That's sir. all I can say. Welcome back to Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. Today we're covering a special two-day-long motions hearing in the case of the killing of Ahmad Arbery. He was the 25-year-old black jogger who was shot to death on February 23rd of 2020 while he was jogging in a Brunswick, Georgia neighborhood. This is him right here. And uh, there were three defendants who were criminally charged, a father and son team, Gregory and Travis McMichael, and a neighbor, William Roddy Bryan. They all have separate counsel. Uh, but somewhat of a united defense here. And there are many, many motions the court is considering over this two-day period, 12 of them to be exact. They're on a lunch break, which is a perfect time for us to bring you your daily sidebar. So I have with me in the studio Court TV anchor Ted Rollins and joining us just outside of the Glynn County Courthouse, Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae standing by as well. Good to talk to you both about this one. Uh, so much to unpack. Um, I thought perhaps we could start with the issue of the prior bad act evidence. And I, I just had a really great conversation with our two legal analyst guests, George Brockler and Marsha Minot. And um, they both agree that perhaps this is about a show because when we have all these prior past incidents, we know that the McMichaels and William Roddy Bryan weren't aware of Ahmaud Arbery's past so that it could factor into the self-defense plea, whether somebody was scared or if the, the victim was the initial aggressor, they weren't aware of any of that. And so to their point, perhaps these attorneys are well aware of that, but just want to put it all out there, put it in the record and hope that the public digests it. So I'm going to get your takes on that, please. Ted, I want to go to you first, if I may. Yeah, I, I think there's some validity to that. They're very upset with the narrative in the public sphere that they believe that their clients have been getting a bad rap with the narrative that they just simply chased down this African-American man because he was running through the neighborhood which seems to be what happened, by the way. But they, um, I think they're enjoying this. They're saying, look at this, look at this, look at what we found about this, about this young man. But what does it matter? And you know, it, that's what, you, you just listen to all of this and you say, okay, great. Well, did, did the McMichaels know about this? Did Roddy Bryant know? No. They had no idea who they were dealing with. And it was that decision, and the, I love the state's argument, that they decided as soon as they took off, they didn't even know he was in that house. They just saw him running by. Um, and uh, it's, to me, I think it is a bit of a show, and they want the public to know that Ahmaud Arbery did this, this, and this. I'm with you, Ted. I'm with you. This is a big stress. I, stress, I, I would be stunned and amazed if the court allows these things to come in. I really would. Uh, Julia, give us your take. What do you think about that, the idea that maybe this is being done just to get it out there into the public? Well, when you look at just how this motions hearing is being handled and what we typically see for a pretrial motion, most of these things just go on the record. And we know that the judge will look at this evidence and go on. But the fact that we had some many opening statements at the beginning of those arguments on the topic of character evidence of Ahmaud Arbery, I mean, that's not typical for a pretrial hearing, but it does break things. It breaks things down. For the public that is watching and it gives them almost something as if they are the jury because there is no jury in that room so usually opening statements would only be for a jury because we know that the judge uh, he understands the law you don't have to break it down for him but we've seen that in previous pretrial hearings so i think that does go to the fact that this may in fact a lot of it have to do with the people who are watching but just to the point of the uh, rule 404B here in Georgia, because that is what the defendant has filed this under. And they say that this is for the purpose of showing Ahmaud Arbery's plan or motive or his preparation that day, why he acted in the way he acted. They think that these prior bad acts go to that, and that is the reason that they can get them in front of the jury. And I can tell you, Julie, in the overflow room where the family is seated watching this, during those response opening statements by the state, Linda Dukowski, uh, Denikowski with the Cobb County District Attorney's Office, uh, when she said, look, 
someone, last time I checked, anyone has a right to be on a public street, even if they don't live there. You heard cheers from the people inside that overflow room. Oh, I bet, Julia, I bet. Uh, let's play a little clip from that, uh, specifically in this one, the DA is talking about the, something we know well, the concept of provocation, that you can't start something and then claim self-defense. Let's watch. They have put us on notice that this is a self-defense case. First off, in a self-defense case, you cannot start it. If you're the first aggressor, you cannot go ahead and murder somebody. They, you can't claim self-defense if you started it. They started this when Greg McMichael saw Ahmaud Arbery running down the street. They had no knowledge that he had been inside 220 Satilla Shores earlier, just moments earlier. They had no knowledge of that. So in order to get out of this problem they have, which is they're the first aggressors. They've got a claim they were making a citizen's arrest. Well, according to their counsel just now, they weren't making an arrest. They were seeking to detain another citizen. And they said, a question is, well, he's a neighborhood he does not live. Last time I checked, this was the United States of America, and you could go anywhere you wanted. He walked into a house that was open. Yes, not his, but not theirs either. He ran away after being seen. We don't know that. We know he ran away. We know Mr. Albenze was across the street on the cell phone making a 911 call. They made multiple attempts to detain Ahmed Aubrey. That's not a citizen's arrest. That's an illegal detention. It's false imprisonment. And. They want to talk about Mr. Arbery's reaction to Greg McMichael and Travis McMichael. It's common sense, fight or flight. And what Mr. Ahmad Arbery did was he fled because he was under no legal obligation whatsoever to stop and talk to strangers who were trying to hit him with their pickup trucks and shoot him with their shotguns. Oh, I love this prosecutor. She is sharp. Oh, I was enjoying her all morning today. I, I can't wait to see her in trial. She, you can just tell when an attorney knows how to run a trial, and I, I bet she's going to be dynamite when this case goes. Um, and Kevin Goff is yes. fun to watch, too. Oh, he's he is a, interesting to watch. Yes, yeah. you're right. Yeah, they for, are both very reason. spirited. Mm -hmm. A lot of passion from, from those advocates. Yeah, fireworks right out of the gate. You were yeah. anchoring the coverage, Ted, and wow, uh, they didn't waste any time. Uh, you can just tell they've all been doing their homework, really chomping at the bit to get here today. And um, one other point that I, I wanted to make that I think that's really important, and when, when lawyers, you know, when you look at the federal rules of evidence, which are typically a guide for how the state rules are going to look from state to state, and here Georgia's rules are strikingly similar to the federal rules, when you have a self-defense case, like that's been indicated here, and you, you have a, a victim in this case, whether this is, we're talking about a homicide or sex assault, this is going to be applicable. But as part of the plea, the defendants can take the initiative to show the victim's character two ways. They can do it by reputation evidence or opinion evidence um, to show that the victim was the first aggressor. So to me, I see another big problem here because that's not what we're getting here. I mean, we're, we're getting specific instances being set forth through the testimony of, of police officers, video evidence. Um, they're, they're looking at documents to show a conviction. That's not someone's reputation. That's not how someone was known in the community. You know, so to me, that's like the other part of the problem. So the first part is the McMichaels and Roddy Bryan, none of them knew anything about Ahmaud Arbery. So that's one huge reason to keep all this out. And then the other reason is this evidence doesn't quite fit the way the rule prescribes it to be introduced. So there is that as well. Just wanted to, to make that point. You both know I love the rules. I love getting into them. So I think that's something we might hear the judge cite later. I want to talk to you both about the, the new DA, Flynn Brody, and how his name came up. Let's take a look at a clip. We have one from both the state and the defense um, and talking about some social media posts that were made by him throughout the campaign and whether or not that's going to be relevant. Let's take a look. The state would object on relevancy grounds to all of this. this these are just literally screenshot, screenshots of social media um, by Flynn Brody and have absolutely no relevance to this case. Most of them appear to just 
attempt to ensure that everyone knows he's a Democrat and that he basically advocated voting and he advocated voting for uh, President Biden. And that is all that is here, with the exception of, I believe, two posts that point the person looking at it to additional outside stories, such as 11 Alive, about this particular case. But that's all that's here. And that is Defendant Brian's 3L on February 22nd of this year at 9.45 p.m., Mr. Brody posted about an 11 Alive news story about this case, just directing people to take a look at it. In addition, on May 9th of 2020, at the time he was a candidate, Mr. Brody posted to a Top Buzz article from Savannah, Georgia, that referenced this case. And that is all that's in here that is referencing this case in any manner, in any manner whatsoever. So we would, um, we ask you to not allow this in. We object to it based on relevancy. There is another motion pending before the court to preserve uh, evidence with respect to the disqualification issue with respect to Ms. Holmes. And I think it's appropriate to address that issue with respect to Mr. Evans and Mr. Brody. The court has ruled against us, and I'm guessing how the court's going to rule, but I want to make it clear on the record that we are asking the court for an order directing Mr. Flynn Brody and Ms. Joya Holmes and Mr. Jesse Evans not to destroy any personal emails, personal texts, or other quote-unquote personal as opposed to business uh, communications with respect to the Arbery case, specifically with respect to any issue with respect to disqualification. The state's response is, this is their personal email and their personal cell phones. And even if they're personal, they could be considered attorney work product. Um, in addition, to ask us to respect our Brady obligations, we understand our Brady obligations, and we will go ahead and uh, do what we're supposed to do. But this motion is not one that is on your list today and untimely, and no one is going to destroy any sort of Brady material, Your Honor, in this case. Oh, Julia, Janae, help us out here. This is hard to follow with so many different DAs having this case. Um, in essence, what exactly is the, the defense trying to say is going on here? They are looking at the current DA who is on this case. He was just elected in November of 2020. So they've looked at how he ran his campaign and the defense is saying that he's not a disinterested prosecutor and that these are the reasons why. They gave a lot of screenshots from social media of Flynn Brody while he was uh, campaigning, while he was getting ready for the November elections, and he was showing his posts about the people that he supported, but also some references to the Ahmaud Arbery case and why there needed to be justice for Arbery's family. And that's really what this is about. But it, there's also a conflict of interest issue between the Cobb County DA's office and the county DA's office here in Brunswick. And they are saying that because of that conflict, they want to see all the emails. They want to see everything between that office and this office from back 2011, I think, is how far this defense wants to go back. The judge ultimately did say that a narrow amount of information should be presented to the court. The court will review it to see whether or not Gregory McMichaels ever had any contact with the Cobb District Attorney's Office back when he was an, an investigator here locally. Mm, Julia, thank you so much for that. Uh, speaking of uh, Gregory McMichael, he and his son uh, looked a lot different today, uh, didn't they, Ted? I, I was watching as you were anchoring earlier and you really noticed uh, the weight loss uh, with respect to them in particular. Yeah, uh, Travis McMichael, especially when he walked into the courtroom, uh, much different look than if you look at his video of the body camera explaining what happened. Um, he has uh, obviously dropped a lot of weight uh, while being incarcerated, and one can only imagine the stress and the dietary changes that he has gone through. Um, yeah, but uh, it was dramatic. I mean, a lot of times we do see defendants come into court for the first time in a long time and say, like, oh, oh, they look different. Um, this was dramatic. 
Oh, most definitely. There he is there sitting down. And uh, this is interesting. First time they've been in the courtroom. I mean, since you know, the pandemic has been going on, everything has been done via Zoom, as we know. But really, we're getting a good look at the three of them today. I've uh, got to leave it there. But Ted Rollins and Julia Janae, thank you both so much. We're going to step aside for a break. When we come back, we're going to continue our live coverage and legal analysis of this motions hearing. Very important issues are being litigated today ahead of the trial for the killing of Ahmaud Arbery. This is Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice.